We are starting with slide 35 from the um, chapter 1, part A, or chapter 1A PowerPoints. Um, we left off with the topic of homeostasis. And so now we're going to move into homeostatic controls. So how, in other words, the way that homeostasis is maintained or controlled or regulated in the body. Um, first of all, make sure that you know the two body systems or organ systems that play a major role in maintaining homeostasis by controlling the other systems are the nervous and the endocrine systems. The um, nervous system tends to have uh, faster responses that don't last as long. And then the endocrine has um, responses that take longer but last longer. So the nervous and the endocrine systems regulate the other systems of the body. The word variable refers to factors that can change, like blood sugar or glucose levels, body temperature, blood volume, levels of ions like, or electrolytes like sodium, potassium, calcium. Um, these are variables that can change that have to be regulated through this process of homeostasis. The homeostatic control of these variables involves three components, the receptor, the control center, and the effector. The receptor is the sensor that monitors the environment and responds to stimuli, which are things that cause changes in the variables. The control center determines the appropriate response, and that's typically the brain, the spinal cord, or a combination, your central nervous system, in other words. The effector receives output from the control center. So it receives a message from the control center um, and provides the means to respond. The response either reduces the stimulus, which is, we call that negative feedback control, or it enhances the stimulus, and that is called positive feedback. But almost every variable is regulated by this process called negative feedback. That is the most common. So we'll talk about negative feedback and spend a little more time on that than positive. So negative feedback is the most used feedback mechanism in the body. The response reduces or shuts off the original stimulus. The variable will change in the opposite direction. That's where the word negative comes from because the variable will change in the opposite direction. Um, for example, an increase in body temperature, the change is going to be to to decrease body temperature. If the um, stimulus or variable is um, an increase in blood glucose levels or blood sugar levels, then negative feedback works to decrease or lower the blood glucose levels. So, and these are the examples given here. Um, regulation of body temperature and regulation of blood glucose are examples um, that are maintained by negative feedback. So an example of negative feedback in the case of blood sugar or blood glucose. The receptors will sense the increased blood glucose. Okay, The pancreas is the control center in this case, and it secretes insulin into the blood. Insulin is in... in this situation, insulin is our chemical messenger, so it's not a receptor, a control center, or an effector, but it's the chemical messenger So um, that is secreted by the control center, which is the pancreas. Insulin causes the body cells, particularly the cells of the liver. These are your effectors, liver cells, muscle cells primarily. These cells will absorb more glucose from the blood in response to the insulin, and that will lower blood glucose levels. Now, this um, animation is on slide 40. I highly encourage you to take, take a note that you need to watch the animation on slide 40 and just go back and look it up in your slides um, because it's, it shows you the um, example of, um, it shows you an example of negative feedback. So here we're going to look at um, a diagram that explains negative feedback. So in step one of negative feedback, you have a stimulus. 
that produces a change in the variable. And so balance is off, okay? Now the receptor detects that change. And then step three, the input step, information is sent along the afferent pathway of the nervous system to the control center, which typically is the brain, somewhere in the brain or the, or the spinal cord. And then um, the afferent pathway, by the way, is like another way of saying the um, sensory pathway. So this is, this is the pathway of um, sensory input to the brain and spinal cord, typically. Step four is the output step. That's where information is sent along the efferent pathway to the effector. And the efferent pathway, we also call that the motor pathway, and that is the response pathway. And step five is the response. The response of the effector feeds back to reduce the effect of the stimulus and um, returns the variable to the homeostatic level. So um, it balances the conditions out again. So if whatever the variable is, if levels of that variable or if that variable increases, then um, the response of the effector is to decrease it. So now what we're looking at is the whole picture because um, now we're going to look at this situation in response to body temperature. So body temperature rises. That's our stimulus. Receptors are tense, temperature sensitive cells in the skin and the brain. The control center is actually the hypothalamus in the brain. It says the thermoregulatory center in the brain, and that's actually in the hypothalamus. So the control center sends the information to the sweat glands. This is just one of the responses to um, rising body temperature. So it causes the sweat glands um, to become activated, release sweat, and that's the response, is uh, the evaporation of sweat leads to the body temperature falling. So the response is opposite of the stimulus, of the initial, initial stimulus, and that's negative feedback. So what if the stimulus is that the body temperature falls, the person becomes colder? Well, the receptors are the same. We have receptors in our skin and our brain that, that send the information to the hypothalamus or control center. Then the control center sends information to our skeletal muscles to cause us to shiver. And that's, that response is that the body temperature rises, um, which is opposite of the stimulus. So this is just one example of negative feedback. Many, many conditions are regulated by negative feedback. Positive feedback is different because in positive feedback, the response enhances or exaggerates the original stimulus. Instead of opposing it or um, negating it, um, the response is to increase that stimulus. So some examples of positive feedback are labor. Uh, labor contractions are enhanced by oxytocin. So when the contractions begin, oxytocin is released. The contractions get stronger, more oxytocin is released. Contractions get stronger. You don't see the increasing contractions and then oxytocin is released and that decreases the contractions. If you've ever known anyone, if you've ever been in labor or known someone who's been in labor, um, the contractions don't decrease. They get stronger, 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 stronger until the process is over, which is the birth of the baby. So that is how positive feedback works. In blood clotting, it's the same thing. When you're injured and your um, blood begins to form a clot, it continues to, um, the clotting process um, is enhanced or increased until the clot is actually formed and, and the bleeding is stopped. So um, that's another example. And another example is um, uh, milk production, uh, lactation. That's another one. So this is how um, positive feedback works in blood clotting. Step one is there's a break in the wall of a blood vessel. This initiates the positive feedback cycle. Step two is that platelets adhere to the site and release chemicals. And then um, step three is that the released chemicals attract more platelets. So you have, you have uh, 
Clotting factors released, more platelets attracted. Clotting factors released, more platelets attracted. Over and over and over until you finally have a platelet plug formed. And so it's just increasing the initial um, response until the process is over. That's positive feedback. All right, so when homeostasis is disturbed, this is our last slide, I think. Yep, it's the last one for this, um, for section 1A. Then we'll move on to, two, to section 1B, sorry. So when homeostasis is disturbed, this can increase the risk of disease. It contributes to the changes associated with aging. Um, when, as we age, our control systems become less efficient. And if negative feedback mechanisms become overwhelmed, destructive positive feedback mechanisms may take over. For example, heart failure, kidney failure, that kind of thing. So we have to maintain homeostasis to stay healthy. Now, this has not been 15 minutes, so I'm going to end this show. I'm, I'm going to go on to the... Um, the slides, actually, I can just go to our class. Okay, so I'm gonna go to slides um, 1B. And what I'm doing here is I'm choosing the first one because I, it's always like I, I put two, two slides, I'll post two set, sets of slides. Okay, so 168 chapter 1A, this first one is the PowerPoint version. And then below that is the PDF. And then this is chapter 1B, the PowerPoint version, and below that is the PDF. Okay, so I'm going to go choose the PowerPoint version, and we're going to start with chapter 1B, which is not long at all, so hopefully we won't have a whole, whole lot more of recordings to do. All right, so now we're going to go into anatomical terms or medical terminology. And I would say for this chapter, the most important topics are the medical terminology topics where you have to learn um, terms that describe directions in relation to the human body. We call those directional terms. And also when you learn the terms for the body regions. So um, medical terminology is going to be the most important thing to learn out of chapter one. And then secondly is to learn about homeostasis, negative and positive feedback. And third, make sure you know those body systems, those 11 organ systems and um, a, a general description of each. So you need to know what is meant by standard anatomical position. Because when we refer to, when we use these different um, directional terms and anatomical terms, we are assuming that the human person, the person is in the anatomical position. That means the body is erect. In other words, they are standing. Their feet are just slightly apart. Palms are facing forward with thumbs pointing away from the body. So this is the position we call standard anatomical position. And you can assume, unless told otherwise, that every body figure that we're, we're discussing is in anatomical position. And the thumbs are pointing away from the body and the palms are facing forward. Um, and by the way, when the palms are facing forward and the thumbs are pointing away from the body, we call this... Um, So when the palms are facing forward, the word for that is supine or supination. When you turn your palms to face forward, um, that's supination. If you turn your palms down, the opposite direction is called pronation. So in the anatomical position, you have your um, palms or your arms are, are um, supine or in they're doing supination. Okay. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Directional terms describe one body structure in relation to another body structure. So direction is always based on standard anatomical position. You assume that your, your um, patient or your um, person is in the standard anatomical position. Right and left refer to the body being viewed, not right and left of the observer or the page. If you're looking at a page in a book, for example, or slides, you know, when we're talking about the slides that we're going through. So table one 
um, is, is going through all of these directional terms. One of the terms is superior or cranial, and that means toward the head. And an example of how you would use that, the head is superior to the abdomen. The next term is inferior or caudal, and that means away from the head or toward the lower part of the body structure, or body, I'm sorry, toward the lower part of a structure or the body. Um, so inferior, so you could say the navel is inferior to the chin. Then we have anterior or ventral, which means toward the front of the body, in front of. An example would be the breastbone is anterior to the spine. And the um, term posterior or dorsal means toward the back of the body or behind. And we would say the heart is posterior to the breastbone or sternum. The breastbone or sternum is anterior to the spine. That means it's in front of it. The heart is posterior to the breastbone or sternum. That means that it's on um, the breastbone is in front of the spine. The heart is behind the breastbone or the sternum. Okay, then we have medial, which means toward the midline of the body. And you could say the heart is medial to the arm. Or you could even say the heart is medial to the lungs. Lateral means away from the midline or on the outer side of. So the arms are lateral to the chest. Intermediate means between um, a medial and lateral structure. So the collarbone is intermediate between the breastbone and the shoulder. Um, let's do another one. What is something that's intermediate between your nose and your ears? Intermediate between your nose, which is medial, and your ears, which are lateral, intermediate would be your eyes. But actually, where I've seen that used the most is, like, for example, when you're naming muscles, um, there are three muscles in the, um, the thigh muscles. They're called the vastus medialis, the vastus lateralis, and the vastus intermedius. So the vastus intermedius is between the vastus medialis and the vastus lateralis. And um, that may be a little more than you <laughs> wanted to hear right now or can, can take, you know, right now in the beginning of the course. But it's just, um, it's a way to name uh, body structures like muscles and nerves and uh, blood vessels. And it'll help you remember them if you know what they mean. Um, okay, real quick, proximal, and actually, you know what, we're running out of time on this recording. I will come back, and this will be our first topic, will be the terms proximal and distal, because they can be um, a little bit challenging. So we, we will start with slide number five of um, the section 1B.